Joining us today is Professor Sam Vaknin. He is the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. Vaknin was born in Israel, the eldest of five children born to Sephardic Jewish immigrants. Vaknin's mother was from Turkey, and his father was a construction worker from Morocco. He describes a difficult childhood in which he writes, quote, uh, My parents were ill-equipped to deal with normal children, let alone gifted. In Israel, in 1995, he was found guilty on three counts of securities fraud. He was sentenced to 18 months, and as a condition of his parole, he agreed to mental health evaluations. And it was discovered that he was afflicted with various personality disorders. According to Vaknin, quote, the most dominant one was NPD, or Narcissistic Personality Disorder. And on this occasion, he accepted the diagnosis because he wrote, quote, it was a relief to know what I had. Hi, Sam, and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Now, I want to ask you, do you consider yourself a narcissist or... No, I'm sorry. This, I'm sorry. This interview, this interview is in my capacity as a professor of psychology. This is not a personal interview, okay? Fair enough. I'll just move on to the next question. Can being intelligent and being aware of it create narcissistic traits in a person in the absence of childhood trauma? Well, there is something called situational narcissism. This is a reaction to life's circumstances and or environments which induce grandiosity. Um, so there have been studies among rock stars, uh, football stars, uh, athletes, celebrities, and so on and so forth, and it seems that they have developed. They scored higher on, for example, the narcissistic personality inventory, which is the standard test we use to diagnose narcissistic personality disorder. So yes, the answer to your question is, uh, if you are sufficiently endowed and make good use of these endowments and the environment reacts to these endowments with admiration, adulation, applause, affirmation or whatever, over, over the years or the decades, uh, you will probably develop some narcissistic traits and behaviors with emphasized grandiosity, which wouldn't make you a malignant narcissist or a psychopathic narcissist and wouldn't even make you a narcissist in the clinical sense, but would make you more narcissistic. Okay. Um, why do you think uh, sometimes when you have a high IQ at a very young age, it sometimes expresses itself with troublemaking behavior? Well, there is no clear association between the two. There are no studies that link troublemaking to high IQ. However, it does tend to reason that someone with a high IQ, until they are diagnosed with the high IQ and until they are taken care of, for example, put in alternative frameworks, it does tend to reason that they would be bored, for example, at school, and that they would make mischief because they're bored. And then once the IQ is diagnosed and appropriate steps are taken to accommodate the child's um, enhanced capacity to absorb, absorb information and process it and so on and so forth, usually this abates. There is no clear link. There's no link um, found yet between giftedness and antisocial traits or behaviors. Okay, so there is no link. Um, but why do you suspect that having a high IQ, sometimes people report being isolated or feeling like it's hard to communicate with others. That's also um, not substantiated by any studies. Emotional intelligence is not related to IQ, high IQ or its absence. Uh, emotional intelligence is highly dependent on upbringing, uh, family of origin, the functioning of um, primary caregivers, primary objects such as parents, role models, peers, others, like grandmothers, grandfathers, etc., etc. Emotional intelligence is also the outcome of being embedded in peer groups. So in the 70s and 60s, we used to take gifted children out of their peer groups, which was a catastrophic mistake. Peer groups are the main regulator and the main progenitors of emotional intelligence. So again, there's no linkage, at least none found in studies between being gifted and lacking emotional intelligence. There are many in, super intelligent assholes, but, but there are many, many under intelligent assholes. 
assholeness is not dependent on intelligence, nor is it correlated with intelligence. Do you think narcissistic style thinking is an advanced form of human capability that make the possessor of such behaviors a cut above the rest when it comes to the success and their chosen goals? I wouldn't use terms such as advanced and a cut above because they imply value judgment. Um, I think what you're trying to ask possibly is whether this is a positive adaptation. In other words, whether it leads to more beneficial outcomes and whether it, um, it is more, more goal-oriented or goal-focused. And the answer to this is it depends. It depends on the society in which these individuals operate. The more narcissistic and psychopathic the society, the more narcissism and psychopathy are positive adaptations. So, for example, in Nazi Germany, it would have behooved you to be a psychopath because you would have climbed the corporate ladder or the SS ladder much faster than someone who, who is not a psychopath. So it, it critically depends on the society. Um, American society has, has become much more narcissistic than, let's say, 40 years ago. This is well established in studies by Twen, uh, for example, by Twengen uh, uh, and Campbell and others. So within such a narcissistic society, narcissists have an inbuilt, hardwired advantage, of course. Um, they function better, they attain greater accomplishments uh, sooner, and they um, accumulate power, prestige, and privileges more than a non-narcissist would. Ultimately, we end up with a narcissist in the White House, a narcissist in numerous positions of power and, and with access to the levers of power. So, for example, in stud studies by Hare and Babiak, um, we found that three, possibly five percent, of all chief executive officers of Fortune 500 companies are diagnosable psychopaths. And we also found that the rates of um, pathological narcissism, known as secondary narcissism, adult narcissism, among college uh, students has increased, increased fivefold since the 1980s. Uh, college students obviously go on to earn more and to reach higher in society's echelons. So the answer, I think, to your question is, in narcissistic societies such as the United States, narcissists have an advantage. In psychopathic societies such as Nazi Germany and po possibly Russia, uh, today's Russia, psychopaths have an advantage. Um, and in non-anomic societies, societies which function properly and are healthy, Narcissists and psychopaths have a disadvantage. Um, they're isolated, they're shunned, they are incarcerated, they are frowned upon, and so on and so forth. So it really depends on the context. Okay, so it really depends on whether the society rewards that kind of behavior. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I've heard you say uh, several times publicly that you suspect that narcissism and psychopathy are part of the same pathology in different gradations. Uh, can you expound on that? Technically, I was the first to suggest this in 1995. I suggested that narcissism and psychopathy lie on the same spectrum and that what we call psychopathy is a, actually a social illness, social malaise, um, the social aspect or actually antisocial aspect of uh, more extreme pathological narcissism. And therefore, I, I suggested that what we call antisocial personality disorder is merely an extreme variant of, of narcissism. Psychopathy as such is not a mental health diagnosis. It is a colloquial term together with sociopathy. It's a colloquial term used by the media, show business, and self-promoting therapies and, and so on. <laughs> and, um, but it has not been accepted by the academic community as a mental, as a clinical entity. Therefore, for example, you will not find psychopathy in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. What you will find instead is antisocial personality disorder. Even this is a hotly contested diagnosis because it smacks of uh, social control, smacks of uh, value judgments. It's more an opinion than, than a diagnosis or a clinical entity. It's like um, uh, if you behave 
in a contumacious way. If you if you disobey the rules, if you break the if you break laws, if you defy authority, then no no no, you're a bad boy, and we will label you. We'll slap a label label on you. There's nothing there in the diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder that is truly about mental health. It's a social devi- deviation, deviation or social aberrance, aberration. It's so the whole thing doesn't smell good, academically speaking. It's not rigorous. Well, academically speaking, we could also make the case for the dark triad. Does that also fall into pop psychology? There has been an avalanche since the mid 1990s. An avalanche to which I unfortunately contributed mightily. And I'm ashamed of my contribution. But there's been an avalanche since the 1990s of unmitigated nonsense, um, buzzwords, uh, catchphrases, and other rubbish that has extremely little to do with uh, the proper study of the human psyche. Um, The dark triad sounds great because it smacks of the Game of Thrones, you know? not because it's anything rigorously studied, documented, and substantiated. I mean, in fairness, can a person have all these traits? A person can have many traits in one. A person can also be short with blue eyes. We don't call it a name. It's um, it's rank nonsense. There, there's no body of studies or experiments or which rigorously supports the conjunction of these traits. In other words, we don't have studies that show that these traits co-appear all the time, um, consistently, in specific populations. So, yeah, but it sounds good, no, doesn't it? It's a fact that you're asking. Um, psychopathy, psychopaths sound good. Psychopathy sounds good, no? Silence of the lambs. So, it's, it's out there. Uh, narcissists are demons or evil. It sounds good. Um, and all empaths, the new, the new term, empath. What the fuck is empath? What on earth is it? I know, in so, uh, certain social circles, it's very popular to be an empath. I mean, what the hell is empath? Everyone has empathy. Everyone and his dog has empathy. Even dogs have empathy. Empathy has been documented in chimpanzees. What on earth is an empath? But everyone, but everyone online, uh, is self-designate, self-designate as victims and then immediately self-designate as empaths. It makes them feel good. It's a narcissistic reaction. Most of these so-called empaths are actually narcissists. It makes them feel superior morally or otherwise. It makes the victimhood stance and their alleged empathic superiority make them, make them feel, you know, grandiose. It's a, it's a grandiose reaction. We are drowning in a sea of rank trash. Most of it is rank trash. 99% of what you see on YouTube and what you read online has to be incinerated. I'm sorry to say this. And replaced with what? Replaced with, with rigorous academic studies, the few that there are. Unfortunately, this void had been created and filled in filled in by scammers and by by wannabe experts and by self-styled scholars and I don't know what. This void is academe's fault because for many decades, academe neglected to study this phenomenon. The last serious study of narcissism had been conducted in 1974. Hold your breath. This is by far the most serious mental health problem we are facing. By far far bigger than schizophrenia and bipolar combined. And yet, the last serious study was by Kohut in 1974. Akadim, Akadim left the field. Akadim left the field to uh, charlatans, simply. And there's a cottage industry of scammers, charlatans, and con artists pretending to be scholars and experts. They, they talk nonsense, they use terminology wrongly, they invent terminology. They, I mean, it's a mess. It's a bloody, unmitigated chaos. And what do you think about the New Age movement of I'm very spiritual and all that kind of stuff? I have no idea what is spirituality, and therefore I don't discuss things that are, by definition, undefinable. 
I have no idea what is spirituality, nor, nor do I discuss uh, in, in the following order, the, fa- the tooth fairy, Santa Claus, God, and the, car- the Jewish carpenter who rose from the, death, from the dead. <laughs> nor do I believe in astrology. Okay, I'll make a note of that. Uh, off to the next question I have here for you. As humans, we naturally connect with each other in subtle ways. I like to call them psychic bridges, these connections. Can these psychic bridges become conduits to spreading narcissism and other toxic behaviors? Yes, I suggested the, uh, I don't know what is a psychic bridge, so we'll put that aside for a minute. But I, I suggested that there are contagion mechanisms. Um, uh, about 20 something years ago, I, I coined the phrase psychopathic and narcissistic overlay. It's when a, a person is exposed to psychopathic and narcissistic behaviors and just in order to survive, has to adopt countermeasures and strategies which essentially mimic the narcissist or the psychopath. In other words, fight fire with fire. And obviously, when you fight fire with fire, you cannot be a fireman. So, yes, victims, uh, given a certain amount of exposure, depth of exposure, intensity of exposure, period of exposure, victims do develop. Um, narcissistic and psychopathic behaviors and even traits. Uh, luckily, these are transient, and once they are removed from the narcissist and psychopath's presence and environment, they tend to regain their former self. But it takes it takes time, and sometimes it it requires help. And if you if you if you um, sort of uh, survey the victim, the online. Uh, self-styled victim forums where victims congregate, um, I think you will immediately see what I mean. These are cesspools of severe narcissistic and psychopathic behavior. These so-called victims um, behave more psychopathically and narcissistically than their alleged abusers. I I have never encountered less empathy and more viciousness than in forums of victims of narcissistic abuse. So this is the outcome of long exposure to vicious and disempathic abusers. But yes, you're right. It, it's contagious. Okay, next question. Why do you think a narcissistic psychopath is worse than a plain old narcissist or psychopath? Well, the, the added epithet psychopathic narcissist, that, that's the correct term, psychopathic narcissist, but it was first coined by Morningstam and others, uh, malignant narcissist, as it was known before, and that term was, that phrase was coined by Kernberg. It simply means that it's a psychopath who also is, who is also antisocial. In other words, it's a psychopath who won't play by the rules and won't collaborate with people. Here's the thing, a classic psychopath, a grandiose psychopath, is actually pro-social. It actually works well with people, works well in teams. Um, And the reason is that psychopaths uh, require narcissistic supply. They require attention, adulation, admiration, affirmation, and so on and so forth from other people. And they require narcissistic supply in order to regulate their internal environment. Their sense of self-worth, for example, fluctuates, is labile. And so the only way to stabilize the sense of self-worth is to, to obtain feedback from the environment, from the human environment. Narcissists crucially depend on input from other people. Thereby, therefore, they cannot alienate other people. They cannot remain alone. They must, must be surrounded with people. And these people must provide them on a constant basis with feedback. So narcissists are pro-social, dependent on people, and and therefore usually gravitate gravitate to positions where they actually end up collaborating with people. So you can end up having a, a narcissistic president, for example, or you can have a, uh, end up having narcissistic doctors and narcissistic judges and narcissistic law enforcement officers uh, and so on and so forth. But immediately you see that these are all people who crucially depend on human infrastructure, on other people, not so the psychopath. The psychopath does not need other people for anything. Psychopaths regard other people as instruments of gratification, objects 
stepping stones, you name it. They objectify people to the maximum and they are not dependent on them. Psychopaths can survive for very long periods of time without any input or feedback from, from other people. Indeed, uh, about one third of the population of prisons in, in, in the West um, have been, one way or another, diagnosed as psychopaths. And, and so when you combine the two, you end up having a narcissist who does not need other people. That is by far the most dangerous combination. What the only thing, the only thing that constrains the narcissist, the only thing that keeps the narcissist uh, in check, the only check checks and the, the only checks and balances in the narcissist's life is is this his neediness, his dependence on other people. That's the only thing preventing the narcissist from. Uh, going the the whole nine yards from from doing the worst from from you know from apocalyptic scenarios and catastrophic behavior. It's the only thing, the narcissist um, wants to lose it. The narcissist wants to cause damage, and then he says to himself, "I can't do that. If I do that, I'm going to lose this person, and this person is my source of supply. So I'm not going to do that." Narcissists therefore have impulse control. They have impulse control. They can delay gratification. They can plan ahead. And they are pro-social, and they work in teams and in groups, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They are, um, they are kind of a tame variant of the psychopath. But if you couple a psychopath and a narcissist, you lose this. You lose you lose this mechanism of, of social control. And then you have a narcissist who would do anything and who does anything to obtain narcissistic supply, sex, power, money, fame, you name it. It's an unbridled narcissist, an, un, an out-of-control narcissist, a loose cannon narcissist, extremely dangerous. Extremely dangerous because both narcissists and psychopaths have problems with what we call internal objects. The narcissist doesn't see other people as people. He internalizes them. He internalizes avatars of other people, and he interacts exclusively with his internal environment. He therefore can trample on people, even kill people, without feeling, without having any emotional reaction, such as remorse or regret or anything, because he is not really killing people. He is simply rearranging his internal furniture. Couple this with the psychopath. Psychopath that has, psychopaths don't have impulse control. Psychopaths don't have any morality of any kind. They 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 have zero empathy. They have something called something which I, which I called cold empathy, the ability to scan people, find out their buttons, hot buttons and vulnerabilities, and leverage these to advantage. But, and so it's really, really alien and predator together. Okay. What about people who are incredibly empathetic, what I like to call toxic empathy? All people, all people in the world have empathy. Even narcissists and psychopaths, they have a truncated form of empathy. It's called empathy. It doesn't have the emotional component. But there is not a single individual, alive or dead, uh, who did not or does not have empathy. Therefore, the term empath is total nonsense. Everyone is an empath. Everyone has empathy. One in a million people are known as HSPs, highly sensitive people. These are people whose empathy is, is um, I would say, highly, in, very intensive. But it's not that they have more empathy than other people. It's they have fewer defenses, fewer. They don't have a skin. They don't have a skin to protect them from the environment. It sounds very similar to borderline personality disorder. Borderline personality has something different that looks the same. Borderline personalities have dysregulated emotions. In other words, they don't regulate their emotional landscape very well. It goes up and down, and it creates something called lability. It looks as though the borderline personality reacts to emotional triggers, but in reality, borderline personalities are highly narcissistic, actually. Indeed, to diagnose borderline, one uses uh, tests that include a narcissistic dimension, include narcissism. Both psychopathy and borderline, and his, I mean, all three actually, psychopathy, borderline, and histrionic personality disorders 
are all diagnosed using a narcissistic scale. So not only borderlines, I mean, the, the common myth is that borderlines have enhanced empathy. Not only they don't have enhanced empathy, they have reduced empathy. They're highly narcissistic. What they are reacting to is not something external. What they are reacting to is the ups and downs, the tidal, the tidal waves, the tsunamis of their own emotions. And their emotions are in borderline. Emotions are triggered mainly by abandonment anxiety, the fear of being abandoned, the fear of losing the regulating external object, meaning the significant other. But coming back to your question, so highly sensitive people are people who simply have no skin, no protection, no outside shell, no envelope. They are, they are raw flesh. They are utterly open immediately with immediacy and directness to any impulse, stimulus or urge from the outside. And they, therefore, uh, can feel, literally feel your pain. So if you're in pain and you encounter an HSP, a highly sensitive person, that highly sensitive person will actually experience your pain. Now, if such a person is in a room and there are 10 suffering people, he will experience the pain of all 10 combined. It's absolutely overwhelming and dangerous to, that to the HSP's uh, mental health and ability to regulate uh, or to compartmentalize his internal environment. There is no inside and outside with such a person. There is no inside and outside. The outside comes directly in, visits the inside immediately. There, there's no, there are no gatekeepers. There are no guardians. There's no lobby or reception area. You go directly to the room. And so, but these are rare. We are talking about one person in a million. All the other so-called empaths online are simply grandiose um, victims who have leverage their victimhood, who, who became professional victims. Many of them make a profit out of it, turn a profit. Many of them gain or garner attention and, and uh, even adulation. Many of them control other people via moderating forums or whatever. It's a very, very sick and toxic environment. It sounds like it. Um, can narcissism or psychopathy, if you will, uh, be cured? It all depends, of course, how you define the word cure. Um, curing or healing has very strong social connotations. So, and for many years has had these connotations, I mean, decades, I'm sorry, has had these connotations. So we were using words like normal. He's not normal. Of course, the normal personality was an absolutely idealistic construct, non-existent, idealized construct, that there was no normal person. And it was statistical in nature what most people do. And it was socially acceptable and socially conformist in nature. What would society accept? What would it reject? What it, would it frown upon? So the normal personality, and for many decades, this was the yardstick, this was the benchmark. Normal personality, the construct of normal personality was a social control mechanism. Indeed, in countries such as the USSR, Soviet Union, the construct of normal personality was used to hospitalize dissidents and political activists as mentally ill people because they did not conform to society. Similarly, in Nazi Germany, people were often put in concentration camps as lunatics, labeled as lunatics, because they would not go along with the extermination of the Jews. And in this sense, betrayed society's values, prevailing values, and were abnormal. So the construct of normal personality has been massively abused by uh, society, especially authoritarian societies, but not only, and lost its, lost its meaning in many, because if something is dependent on a specific society in a specific period, it's not a clinical entity. It doesn't have an objective existence. It's not like, for example, tuberculosis. Tuberculosis was the same in ancient Rome, in, in ancient Palestine, in today's Egypt, and in tomorrow's United States. It's a clinical entity. It, it's immutable. It never changes. So not so the normal personality. So we, we understood that it, it's, mean, it's a meaningless construct and a dangerous one. Instead, today, we ask two questions only. 
when we ask ourselves, is someone, is someone in need of curing or healing? Is someone in need of intervention? Is someone in need of therapy? We actually ask only two questions. Is this person egosyntonic? In other words, does this person feel comfortable with himself? Is he happy? And the second question is, does this person function properly in a variety of settings? Does he function properly in the family, in the workplace, in society, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? If the answer to these two questions is yes and yes, we do not, we do not label this person as abnormal, nor do we administer any intervention or therapy. So in a way, it's whether the individual functions properly uh, within the society he lives in. Well, when we say function properly, again, you're right. There are social hues. It's imbued with a, with a kind of social judgment. But I think um, it has more to do with how the individual feels. So if, for example, I, I, keep, losing my, I keep losing jobs, I keep being fired, even I would say that something's wrong with me. Something, you know, I'm dysfunctional. Some, there's something wrong with my function. If I if I'm if I've divorced already six times, probably even I would admit that something's wrong with my relationship skills. So, yes, functioning is heavily dependent on social expectations and social mores and social. But at some point, even the individual would admit that something's wrong. Even even a totally anti-authoritarian, anti-authority. Um, outlier, outcast, uh, re rebel, at some point must admit that his, his life is not working. There's something's wrong. He's not getting it right somehow. That's actually another question I wanted to ask you. Are narcissists and psychopaths aware of their condition? Most of them are, contrary to the, again, nonsense spewed out online. The vast majority of narcissists and psychopaths are fully aware that they are narcissists and psychopaths. Actually, if you talk to narcissists and psychopaths, as I've been doing in the last 25 years, you would discover that it's cause for pride. Uh, narcissists would tell you that they are the next step in the evolutionary ladder. Narcissists would tell you that other people are weak and, and stupid and broken and vulnerable and don't deserve to live. Um, psychopaths uh, would tell you that their victims deserved, they had it coming because they acted foolishly, and so on and so forth. So psychopaths would willingly admit, willingly, not, I mean, they, they do admit that they are ruthless, that, but they consider all these uh, ruthless, merciless, disempathic, but they consider all these traits, all these qualities, as evolutionary advantages. Both narcissists and psychopaths are emotionally invested in their disorders. They are what we call cathected, cathected. They have something called cathexis. It means they are somehow proud of their disorders, invested emotionally in their disorders, and promote their disorders as non-disorders. So again, as the next step in evolutionary ladder, as a positive adaptation, and you have, you have scholars that aid and abet this process. You have someone like Kevin Dutton, like Maccabi, like others who say that psychopathy and narcissism are good things. Okay, I want to do a simple mental exercise. The setting is a prehistoric jungle with limited resources, and it represents a microcosm of today's society. We have two groups. One is represented by an individual, individual A, which is a narcissist, and individual B, which possesses a normal personality, let's say. If a, uh, a person A, the narcissist, is willing to lie, cheat, and steal, which results in collecting resources faster and in larger amounts, doesn't it make the case that indeed the narcissist is better adapted to succeed in any situation? Because at the end of the day, any situation is really about limited resources and your ability to acquire them. Well, first of all, it's short-term thinking. Probably collaborating with the other guy would help to produce... Uh, more food in the long run. So this is short-term thinking, short-termism. In the short term, yes, it would guarantee the narcissist survival. That's one thing. Second thing, we don't live in a jungle. So the question is theoretically interesting, but practically irrelevant. Thirdly, well, we did before in our ancient history. 
Yes, but are we discussing ancient history or, or Nazism? Well, even as human beings today, we are actually a product of those prehistoric environments. Are you asking, are you asking if Nazism used to be a positive adaptation? The answer is categorically not. All, all uh, human accomplishments depended crucially on collaboration. Hunter-gatherer societies, which were the first societies ever, depended absolutely crucially on collaboration. Well, wouldn't narcissists and psychopaths be weeded out at some point? Why are they still here today? Assuming they are genetic. Assuming there's a genetic component. We are very far from making this claim. Weeded out means natural selection. Natural selection operates on genes, not on anything else. So if narcissism and psychopathy were genetically predestined or predetermined, uh, one would have assumed that the phenomenon would have dwindled. That it hasn't dwindled, and on the contrary, that it, it, uh, there's uh, an ebb and flow of narcissism indicates that it's not entirely genetic, that it is actually much more environmental. Um, so ancient societies depended even more crucially than modern societies on collaboration, because in modern society you can safely not collaborate. You can isolate yourself at home, and given sufficient resources, you can be fully, fully self-sustaining and, and self-sufficient. You don't need to collaborate. Modern society being narcissistic and increasingly more psychopathic is, is hell-bent on atomizing people, on rendering them self-sufficient. Because that's a narcissistic thing. You're right about this. That's a psychopathic thing, actually. So we have technologies that encourage us, encourage these technology encourage us to separate ourselves from other people because increasingly we can do everything alone. We don't need other people. This is not an accident. It's not that um, these technologies created narcissism. It's narcissism created these technologies. And we have an increasing preference to, to, to remain alone, to be lonely, to separate, not to interact. By the way, not, not even sexually. For example, the amount of dating among teenagers has literally collapsed by 53%, according to, to uh, Twenge and Campbell, by 53% in less than eight years. In the past eight years, teenagers date each other 53% less. The amount of sexual activity in two widely studied societies, the United Kingdom and Japan, has collapsed by almost 60%. This is sex and dating, the most primordial forms of social interaction. Okay, that's very interesting. Hmm. Okay, so I want to ask you this next question. Uh, is narcissism, do you think, a reaction to obscurity in highly populated regions all over the world? Especially when it comes to the, I think, the narcissistic need to escalate their behavior, if you notice, to garner more attention uh, for themselves. For example, I'm sure you're aware of that demographic that likes to put uh, tattoos in highly visible areas in their body. And does it seem in a broader context uh, that this behavior, namely attention-seeking, belongs under the rubric of assorted mating strategies? Yes, that was my original thesis. My original thesis is that Nazism is a reaction to the population, uh, growth in population. That we need to be seen, I have a whole lecture online on this, we need to be seen. Um, the need to be seen is, is about survival. If you are not seen as a baby, you die. You need to be noticed by your caregivers, and they have to give you food, it's a shelter, etc. If you don't, you die. So to be seen is intimately connected with survival. So you need to be seen. Uh, it's easier to be seen when there are 1 billion people on the planet than when there are 8 billion. So we need to escalate our behavior and, uh, and in order to be noticed, simply to be noticed, to be seen. Now, this escalation in, in uh, behavior is, of course, narcissistic in itself. It, it leads to, it's a vicious, vicious circle, vicious cycle. I mean, so indeed... It seems like narcissism is uh, some sort of mating strategy. Narcissism is 
about um, setting yourself apart in a way. No, I don't think it's about mating at all. I think narcissism is the exact opposite of mating. Uh, at the end, I think what will happen is that there will be billions of people, each in in his or her own cubicle, with se- with empowering technologies, empowering and atomizing technologies, interacting essentially solipsistically with themselves, and self self providing everything, including sex, possibly with sex dolls or pornography, as, as the case may be, or both. Ultimately, I think people um, are caught in a bind. On the one hand, they need to be seen, and so they crave attention. They crave to be noticed. But on the other hand, they are not. They want to be self-sufficient and and to not have to interact with others. So I think at the very end we will come to something which Guy Debord in 1968, a French philosopher. He called it the society of spectacle. I think at the very end, at the end of time, if you wish, to use uh, eschatological terms, at the very end, I think we're going to have billions of people who never, ever interact with each other in any way, shape, or form, including sex, but solicit each other's attention via intricate networks. In this sense, I think that narcissism is, is a kind of new religion. It's a distributed religion where every narcissist is a godhead with with a faith with one member. And every narcissist is a node in a network. The network metaphor is very apt here. So it's the first distributed religion. But of course, gods, gods except in the Greek pantheon, gods are solipsistic creatures. Uh, there's only one God. And so the more we become godlike, either with technological empowerment or in our own minds as narcissists, because narcissists are omniscient, they're omnipotent, they're exactly like God, they're gods. The more we become godlike, the more we will withdraw from other gods, and the more we will create bubble universes, silos, in which we will operate totally solipsistic, totally alone soliciting from each other only attention, nothing else, not sex, not companionship, not support, not help, nothing, not money even, nothing. The currency of the future is going to be attention and the expectation of attention. That's how I see the the future world. Wow, that sounds like a very, very sad world to live in. And from your studies, uh, especially studying the subject for such a long time, You're definitely an authority in narcissism. Who do you think embodies uh, the quintessential narcissist, dead or alive? Who's the biggest, biggest narcissist you've ever studied? Well, the consummate, I mean, the the epitome of psychopathy would be Adolf Hitler. That doesn't come as much of a surprise, I should assume. And the epitome of narcissism would be probably be Jesus Christ. Probably. Um... Modern day, a modern day variant of narcissism, grandiose narcissist, somewhat laughable, would be Donald Trump. But of course, he's not comparable to Jesus, not in reach, not in impact, not in anything. It is, these are, the trends I'm, I'm talking about, these are not uh, two-year trends or 20-year trends or even 500-year trends. This is, these are trends that have, that have commenced a long time ago. And so, if you ask me for for uh, to identify the historical figures that have shaped the modern world, I think we live in a, in in a world that was essentially shaped by three people, all three of whom have been psychopaths and narcissists: Jesus Christ, Adolf Hitler, and in between them, Thomas Cromwell. These are the three that, that shaped the modern world. And all three have been rank narcissists, and in one case at least, uh, a psychopath. Okay. Um, Now, going back to the original uh, mental exercise where the setting was the jungle, uh, what if individual A, which was a narcissistic person, were to dominate uh, individual B, which was the normal subject, 
and take 100% of his resources and only give him back 25%. And uh, individual A keeps 75% of the resources for himself. What did that make the point that, he, in fact, he is a success genetically in terms of mating and his progeny? No, I don't see what this has anything to do with narcissism. Today, people use the word narcissism to describe any act of subjugation, dominance, exploitation. I mean, a woman is unhappy with her husband because he doesn't he eats with an open mouth and he's a narcissist. Uh, um, uh, a husband is unhappy with his woman, with his wife, because he, I mean, everyone calls everyone narcissist. What, what you have described, what, what, what on earth does this have anything to do with narcissism? Well, the way I understand narcissism, or the way it's been described to me, is that the, the individual affected with this is only interested in himself and he doesn't care about others. But if I give you 25%, then I care about you. I care about your needs. Well, only enough to uh, subsist so I can exploit more resources. So what? Well, how is that connected to narcissism? Because you make it very clear that narcissists see other people as pawns. Narcissism is a clinical, narcissism is a diagnosis, a clinical entity. Not a buzzword or a catchphrase. I am fighting against this trend of slapping the label of narcissism on any behavior you dislike. I think, for example, that what you have described is an, a completely rational, benevolent division of labor and resources. Okay. Because it guarantees the survival of both. Where on earth do you see narcissism in this? Okay. Well, let's look at Donald Trump. According to you, he's a narcissist. He's a grandiose, grandiose narcissist. A yes. grandiose narcissist. So how is it that a grandiose narcissist who's only interested in short-term gains was able to be a, you know, arguably a successful businessman and become the president of the United States, the most powerful country in the world? I did say that, that narcissists are pro-social, collaborate with other people to obtain, to obtain goals. Grandiose narcissists... The goal, the main goal of the grandiose narcissist is to sustain his grandiosity. He doesn't care much about anything else. He guards his grandiosity jealously. He is hypervigilant in the sense that he scans for attacks and criticism, sees insults everywhere, reacts explosively to perceived slights and, and injuries, and so on and so forth. So he's preoccupied with maintaining um, a concocted, fictitious self-image. That kind of narcissist is far less concerned with maximizing, uh, for example, profits. That would be psychopathic. Again, the distinction between psychopath and, and narcissist is a dis distinct, uh, distinction in measure. I mean, it's, a, it's on a spectrum. But someone like Donald Trump could definitely be community-oriented, could definitely collaborate with other people, could pursue long-term goals, could have a vision of the world, you can disagree or, or agree with this vision of the world, could be very productive, and indeed we have the term productive narcissist or high-functioning high narcissist, and so on and so forth. He just would be concerned with his image. So whenever you will try to tell him that he's not a genius, he will call you an idiot. He will humiliate you and insult you publicly. Whenever you try to imply that he's wrong, he will contest or try to harm you, etc., etc. So his vulnerable point is his grandiosity. There are other narcissists and there are psychopathic narcissists. They would be concerned with sex or with money or with power. But allocation of resources between people, power matrices, division of labor, that's all economics. That's not psychology. There is no psychology implied in any of this. It's not narcissistic. It's not psychopathic. It's the way society organizes and distributes and redistributes its economic resources. Many people would say that it's utterly psychopathic to tax the rich and give it to the poor. Many. There's a whole literature about this. When income tax was first introduced 100 years ago, you could have read tracts, books, pamphlets, Articles claiming that this is armed robbery, that this is, you know, horrible, that the rich should give part of the, some of their property to the poor. A moral case can be made against this. The Puritans have made it in the 17th century. 
So whenever we abuse, whenever we abuse one discipline, in this case psychology, to tar and tarnish and label our adversaries, we abuse the discipline itself. It is not okay to take the word narcissism and apply it to anyone you dislike or to policies you disagree with or to things you consider morally morally justified or reprehensible. Okay, but in all fairness, sometimes those things could be aligned, right? Sometimes you might not like someone and they also happen to be a narcissist. Okay, so now let me ask you. Uh, psychopathy is not really considered a clinical term, correct? Today, no. Okay, so the difference between narcissism and psychopathy also has to do with object constancy, correct? Object constancy uh, was first described by Jean Piaget, who was a child psychologist in 1968. He called it at the time object permanence. Later on, it came to be called by American scholars object constancy. It simply means that you are able to maintain a representation of someone you're emotionally interacting with in whatever way. When you are interacting with uh, someone emotionally, it could be that you love them, you hate them, doesn't matter. If you are able to maintain a representation of that person in your mind, even when that person is physically unavailable, absent, then you have good object constancy or object permanence. If you are unable to do this, then you have object inconstancy or object impermanence. Now, narcissists have a problem with that, but not in the, not in the classical sense. Um, they have difficulties with object constancy, and what their solution is to create a representation, an avatar of the person, and then to continue to track, interact only with this avatar, only with this representation, so that they have only internal objects. They don't interact with external objects, only with the representations. Um, psychopaths, on the other hand, do not create such representations at all. They interact only with the external objects. So we have, um, here perhaps is one of the tr very few true differences between psychopaths and narcissists. So a psychopath would regard other people as, as you would regard, for example, a car or a laptop. You would never create a representation of the laptop and continue to interact with it in, inside your head. You would always refer or revert to the laptop. Psychopaths treat all people like this, as though they were external objects. Narcissists, on the other hand, would create, in the laptop example, a representation of the laptop and then would ignore the laptop completely and continue to interact only with the representation. Now, the reason for this is that narcissists have something called abandonment anxiety or loss anxiety. And so this is their way of solving the problem of, of pain. When they experience loss of a source of supply, they disintegrate. In order to not experience the pain associated with such a loss, they create a representation of the source of supply. And so it's always there. It's part of them. They control it. It's an extension of, of the narcissist. The minute I convert you into an extension of myself, then you're mine. Even if you go away, even if you were to vanish tomorrow, it doesn't matter because I have, what it, I have you. You're inside me. And so we have these very bizarre situations where narcissists uh, lose, lose contact with someone, lose touch with someone for, for 10 years, and then they meet him or her 10 years later, and they pick up um, where, they, where they dropped off. Like they pick up as though they have met only yesterday. And they are shocked if the real object, if the real person had experienced changes in their lives because they, they've never interacted with the real person. So this is the, this is the issue of object uh, constancy or object permanence. Are cluster B personality disorders an extension or variation of narcissism? Yes, well, cluster B was just a name given to four, four personality disorders which at the time in the year 2000s, 20 years ago, um, scholars believed exhibited dramatic features, like they were uh, drama queens. You know? uh, today we are hopefully much more nuanced than this, so um, we don't use cluster B anymore, but it's still useful to group these uh, together, I agree. 
Borderline personalities were first described by a guy called Kernberg, psychologist called Kernberg, uh, one of the towering intellects of the field. And his idea was that there is a border, there's a, a line between neurosis and psychosis, uh, between having your, your, thing, your stuff together and losing it. And some people, he said, straddle this line. Some people are sometimes all together and sometimes totally disintegrated and, and psychotic. Yeah? So he called these people borderline because they are on the border. He called them borderline people, borderline personalities. Much later, we, we developed a whole theory of borderline personality disorder that incorporated elements of narcissism. So most borderlines have pronounced narcissistic traits. Um, for example, many of them are grandiose. Many of them have abandonment anxiety. Many of them compensate by uh, compensate for the abandonment anxiety by becoming um, aggressive or violent and and so on and so forth. So they have some narcissistic traits, but the two are are clearly dis- demarcated, clearly distinguished. Um, up to a certain point. It was believed that the vast majority of borderlines are women and the vast majority of narcissists are men. So there was a nagging suspicion that we're actually talking about something something called culture bound syndrome. In other words, not a real clinical, not a real disease. But men are more aggressive and testosterone laden, so we call them narcissists. And women are more, you know, labile and more sensitive, so we call them borderlines. Like we, we label, we pathologize people just because of who they are. And it's not really a mental illness, not really a mental problem. Today, I think we have a much more balanced uh, view. There are people who find it extremely difficult to regulate their emotions, to control their emotions, to to regulate their internal environment. And they're all over the place. They have severe abandonment anxiety because they use other people to help them to hold their stuff together. These are the borderlines. And they are, yes, they are very distinct from narcissists, only they have narcissistic elements. I also read several articles on the subject of borderline, and uh, they seem to choose specific types of men, namely narcissists or psychopaths. Do you think there's any validity to that, or is that part of uh, pop psychology fluff? My, my good friend, uh, Joan Lachkar, was uh, the first to suggest that uh, borderline uh, women at the time would tend to choose narcissistic men because the initial trauma that had created borderline resonates well with the traumas that had created uh, narcissism. The wounds resonate. And so she she was the first to suggest that uh, uh, there would be a preponderance of borderline narcissistic couples. Later on, studies have shown this to be true. And it seems that borderline women gravitate towards narcissistic and, and psychopathic men. And the reason is that um, the psychopathic, the psychopaths and the narcissists allow the borderline woman to recreate her initial trauma, to, to, relieve, to relieve the pain, to relieve the, the uh, primary wound that had led to the formation of borderline personality disorder. Now, we all, we all have something called comfort zone. The comfort zone is that area of functioning and emotions and traits and behaviors where we feel most comfortable. We feel most comfortable because we know the rules, we know the ropes, we know how to behave, we know what's going to come, we know we can predict outcomes, we can predict how people will, will conduct themselves, etc., etc. The comfort zone can be a negative zone. For example, we discovered, we, we have quite a few studies that show that women who grew up in abusive households would tend to choose an abusive partner. Why is that? Because they can predict the abusive partner. They know what to expect. They know the ropes, they know rules, they know how to manipulate the abusive partner. So they would tend to create a comfort zone which would essentially include extreme abuse, including domestic violence and sometimes life-threatening domestic violence. And still they would feel good in such an environment And they would feel totally out of the water when they are with a nice guy or with a good man, a man who doesn't abuse them. Actually, there is something called projective identification, where it's a process whereby if such a woman, for example, finds herself with with a nice guy, she would push him to become an abuser 
because you would feel extremely uncomfortable. So it's it's the same with the borderline women. Borderline women would choose narcissists and psychopaths because they are the ones who can recreate for them the comfort zone. No one else can. Borderline, the genesis of borderline is usually in very abusive or dysfunctional households. And so they, uh, the borderline woman needs to recreate this household just to feel at home, simply. And the narcissists and psychopaths are the service providers. Similarly, the narcissists and psychopaths would, would need a borderline woman because most narcissists and psychopaths are the outcome of early childhood abuse by women who were essentially narcissistic or borderline. And so they would, they would choose mother. They, they would choose women who, who would recreate for them the initial traumatic environment. Now, just with your, with your kind permission, just one caveat. Is when, when you go online or even when you read scholarly texts, they talk about abuse and they usually refer to classic forms of abuse, like, you know, uh, sexual abuse, physical abuse, psychological, verbal. But abuse has many forms. Abuse is any situation where the child's emerging boundaries, where the child's emerging ego, the child's emerging individual individuality, they're denied. The child is not allowed to separate from the parent and to individuate, to become an individual. Now, this can be done, of course, by, by violating the child's sexual, by violating the child's body. When you violate the child's body, you don't allow the child to separate. But it can also be, for example, by converting, transforming the child into the tool, a, a tool to realize the parent's unfulfilled dreams, putting the child on a pedestal, put, pushing the child to behave in certain ways, providing conditional love, performance-based love, et cetera, et cetera, so many ways to abuse. And so any situation where the child is not allowed to go through the process known as separation individuation is is abuse. And so narcissists and psychopaths, when they choose borderline women, they want to be re-abused because they feel comfortable in an, in a, an environment where a woman abuses them. Because most of the abuse in early childhood is meted, meted out by mother, who is usually a woman. And, and so John Lachkar was the first to point out that um, based on this theoretical consideration, considerations, we should expect borderlines and narcissists to gravitate toward each other and form mutually wounding bonds, bonds where they wound each other all the time, and so make each other comfortable. <laughs> and this is what we had indeed discovered since then. So do you think those sort of relationships last long term, or is the cycle generally breaking up and getting back together? Well, they do break and uh, come back together. These are disruptions in a, in a long-term relationship. Uh, there is something called trauma bonding. Um, trauma bonding is very difficult to break because trauma is the most intim is the highest form of intimacy there is. It's more intimate than sex. It's more intimate than anything else. Trauma is really reaching for the core. Really, you know. So when your partner provides you with constant trauma or access to trauma, you become addicted to your partner. Plus, if your partner is a source of pain, humiliation, hurt, bullying, only your partner can take it away. If your partner is the one who gives you pain, he's the only one who can take away the pain. If he's the one who humiliated you, who had humiliated you, he's the only one who can restore you. And this process is called intermittent reinforcement. So, Partners of narcissists and psychopaths become actually addicted, addicted to this unpredictability, to, this, to these ups and downs, to the vicissitudes, to the lability of the relationship itself. And this addiction is almost impossible to break, almost. That's why recidivism, the rate of return, for example, we, we separate these couples, and then how many of them come back? So it's like 80%. The, the woman who comes back to the narcissist knows very well she's about to be abused, possibly life-threateningly abused, uh, bitten, I mean, you name it, humiliated, prostituted. I mean, we have everything there, the whole gamut. And yet she keeps coming back in 80% of the cases. The trauma is utterly addictive. 
the the high the high of being consoled and comforted after having been beaten, humiliated, and, and trodden upon. This high is incomparable. Nothing can compare to it. It's a little like parental displacement. It's like the narcissist at the same time plays the abuser and then the father who rescues his daughter from the abuse. And, and this is a morality play. It makes the woman feel like a princess, like a damsel in distress. And then this knight in shining armor comes to save her. So there is, there is a narrative here, which is archetypal, to use Jungian terms, where there is, there is the, the woman experiences the drama of being, um, you know, being uh, abused, enslaved, if you wish, and then rescued. Rescue, uh, you could ask anyone who, who had ever been rescued, someone who was drowning and was rescued, someone who was in a fire and was rescued. Rescue is the ultimate form of high. No drug compares to it. And here's someone who can, who can recreate this theater play for you on a daily basis. Do you know how addictive this is? Yes, I imagine uh, it would be. That's a very interesting take. Now, I want to ask you questions that maybe no one has asked you before. Maybe. I might be wrong, though. Sure. But the question of philosophers like Plato or Marcus Aurelius and how some of their writings and ideas convey a sort of narcissism, what do you think about that? Well, I'm not sure which of the ideas you, you refer to. I... I the re the republic the republic because Plato has or the allegory of the cave, I mean that whole idea that people are shadows, or the idea that by behaving or controlling your thoughts in a certain way you're able to access certain things in life that otherwise you wouldn't be able to that whole that whole theme really. The two individuals you you mentioned they were concerned with something called eudaimonia, which means the good life, and they or the epicurean life. Yes, and they believe that you have to be phronetic. You have to, to act properly in order to, to ensure or guarantee a good life. And, for example, you have to act according to your free will. And if you don't, you engage in something called acrasia, which is acting against your better judgment, acting against your free will, acting as an agent of forces that you disagree with, etc., etc. So there was a whole philosophy there about the good life. And the good life was the exact opposite of narcissism, by the way. The good life had to do with inner balance that actual, that ends up benefiting society. So first, inner balance, and then once you have attained this inner peace and inner harmony um, via a series of, of recipes, yes? Uh, in the case of Marcus Aurelius, via meditations. In the case of Plato, via actions. In the case of Socrates, via questioning. Um, et cetera, et cetera. There were various ways to reach eudaimonia. But once you have, you will have become a useful social agent. The emphasis was actually quite social. So this is the, the antithesis, I think the exact opposite of, of narcissism. Um, okay, well, specifically, I'm talking about a particular quote in uh, Marcus Aurelius's meditations. And as people know, uh, his meditations weren't meant to be uh, read in public. Mm, it was something yeah. he wrote for himself, uh, for his own, uh, for his own uh, self. Uh, he says, quote, Stay alert, Marcus. Longing for enjoyment and happiness in a world where there's nothing constant, sim it's similar to madness. It's just the same as falling in love with birds flying by. That's kind of what I'm getting at, the idea that people or events in the outside world or nothing more than shadows or furniture. Uh, it almost speaks to object constancy. Oh, I don't think I don't think at all this is what he said, or what he even meant. This is uh, one of the passages, a uh, few, which are influenced by the Stoic school, uh, which were influenced by the Stoic school. The Stoic school had nothing to do with objectifying people. Stoic school was how you should con uh, how you should comport yourself internally 
uh, when you react to life's events and, and vicissitudes and circumstances. So it was um, uh, it was a guide to conduct. So I think this is what he meant. He obviously did not mean to. On, on the contrary, you, there's any number of quotes from Marcus Aurelius that that say exactly the opposite. That uh, you know people are important. You should be you should work with them, pay attention to them. Society is crucial, and so on and so forth. He did, however, uh, he he was, however, the precursor to such to such social movements such as the absurd in France in the, and existentialism later. Uh, anything from anything from Kierkegaard to Sartre, yes. So these are recurring themes. No one is inventing the wheel anymore. Everything we have said was and can say has been said before. I don't know how many times. Um, however, you're right that there are there are um, there are how to call it streams or strands in philosophy and so on, which are highly narcissistic, and there are those which are not. I don't know if you want to go right now into discourse of of philosophy, but yes, philosoph but, but but philosophers like everyone else are humans. Well, some of them. And those who are, and except for Socrates, <laughs> yeah, the, the, he was immortal. And um, and uh, some of them were obviously narcissistic. So narcissistic philosophers created uh, narcissistic philosophies and theories of mind and theories of the world. So, but I don't think you can find a consistent system of philosophy founded on narcissism. And that is where I, I'm suggesting that we are about to enter a new age. Because I think, as I told you, or as I hinted before, I think narcissism is actually a new faith. It's not, well, it started as a mental health construct, and then it became an organizing principle, and, and a hermeneutic principle, an explanatory principle. It's a principle that explains the world and what agents in the world do. So it explains other people to us. It explains politics. It explains culture and art and many things. So it is, it's an organizing principle of society. The more society becomes narcissistic, the more it uses narcissism as a, as a cornerstone. And the more it aligns itself with narcissistic morals, considerations, values, and so on. But it also explains the world. And, and ultimately, it imbues the world with meaning and direction. But this is only the first phase. I think the next phase is that narcissism will coalesce with the help of technology, will coalesce into a religion, a faith, a new faith. It is then, I think, that we are going to be begin to see narcissistic systems of philosophy. Of course, one can point to Ayn Rand, yes, as an example. So one can point to Atlas, Atlas Shrugged or, you know, the Fountainhead. As, as narcissistic texts. But these are, it's not exactly a philosophy. It's, it's a precursor to a philosophy. It's not, I'm talking about whole systems of philosophy. And of course, one can point to, to movements like utilitarianism. Utilitarianism can be easily cast as a narcissistic or even psychopathic system of philosophy. But it's, we are still not there. I think when narcissism becomes the new faith, the new religion, a distributed religion where we are all gods because we are all fully empowered and we are nodes, equipotent nodes in a network of gods, it is then, I think, that we will have to come up with new philo a new philosophy. And that new philosophy is bound to be narcissistic. I'm looking forward to this. It should be very interesting. Because how can you construct a philosophy that accounts only for godlike nodes, godlike individuals. We have hints of how this can be done in computer science, where we can see, for example, studies, philosophical, metaphysical studies of neural networks uh, or equipotent, equipotent nodal networks and so on. And this, so those are hints of things to come. I think ultimately the whole all of humanity will be considered like um, will be considered in the same terms. And um, but how can you construct a philosophy that accounts only for nodes and for an, a network, but doesn't account, for example, for collaborative effects? 
doesn't account for teamwork, doesn't count for social needs, doesn't count. So I think such a philosophy will come into fruition and into existence only when society itself will disintegrate. Narcissism and society are incompatible. These are incompatible concepts. They are diametrically opposed. They are enemies. They are antithesis. Uh, so you mean in high numbers because narcissism has always been around in small numbers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, when, when narcissism becomes the, the prevalent mode. Um, narcissism, I mean psychopathic narcissism, to be more precise. When psychopathic narcissism becomes a prevalent mode, society will have, will have vanished. We already see crucial, critical institutions of society vanishing. For example, uh, family. The family is a thing of the past. Families, a thing of the past. Communities, think of the past. Villages, think of the past. Even, I would say, love is becoming a thing of the past with dating apps and casual sex. I mean, all the underlying, all the institutions that underlay all societies since the inception of, of, of society, I mean, since, let's say, 10,000 years, all these institutions are disintegrating and vanishing. What will happen when the last institution will vanish? Society itself will vanish. Society is just a name we give to an agglomeration of mutually interacting institutions. Take away these institutions one by one by one, and society itself will disappear. It's just a label. And now we see the same beginning to happen in politics. Bipartisanship and so on is at a point of paralysis. Politics is paralyzed completely. Not only here, by the way. Not only in the United States, in the United Kingdom, wherever you look, in the, in the European Union, and so on. So politics as a pillar of society is vanishing. Family has vanished. Communities have vanished. I mean, you name it. All the major institutions that underlay our organizational principle, which was society, eventually. I think the next organizational principle to succeed the organizational principle of society will be indeed narcissism. That's the next big revolution in human affairs. That's how we are going to organize ourselves for the next maybe 10,000 years. Now, whenever we organized ourselves in a certain way, we also immediately came up with a religion or religions, with a philosophy or philosophies, and with modes of exchange, which in the case of our current phase was money. I think in the future, we are going to see the same. We're going to see a new organizational structure, which is what we call today narcissism. It will replace society. I think we're going to see a new religion, which will, will be distributed with equipotent nodes in a network, where everyone is a god, everyone is a worshiper, and everyone is a one-man cult. I think we're going to see philosophies justifying narcissism, promoting narcissism, underlying narcissism, uh, developing and elaborating on narcissism, etc., etc. That will be that will become the ethos of modern philosophy, and I think we are going to see a new means of exchange, a store of value and a store of expectations, which will not be money. I think you mean like cryptocurrencies? Yes, exactly. I think crypto assets are the harbingers of this. Harbingers, because what are crypto assets? They're not assets. Crypto assets have exactly two elements, identity verification and store of expectations. Not value, not value, no real exchange there. Crypto assets, especially cryptocurrencies, they use blockchain technology to verify identity unequivocally and safely, and they store expectations about future value, which is what we used to call speculation. So I think this will be the new mode of exchange. Why is that? Because old ways of organizing economies will have vanished. Consider, for example, the antiquated, the antiquated practice known as labor. It's a practice where you take human bodies, harness them, and leverage them to produce goods and services. How 19th century this is. Shortly, automation will replace well over 50% of all the jobs in the world. That's not Sam Vaknin, that's McKinsey. Shortly, the very concept of labor 
would look so outlandish, so anachronistic. So here you take one of the two major pillars of modern economics, modern economies, labor and capital. Capital is vanishing and being replaced by numerous, you know, cryptocurrencies and this and that. And labor is vanishing, replaced by automation. And ruling over all this mess will be artificial intelligence. Yes. That's the picture. That's the picture of the world to come. And I know there's a church of artificial intelligence. Yeah, we have harbingers of everything. We have we have all the signs. All the signs are there. You just need to read the tea leaves, you know. The tea leaves are, are floating in the wind. You, know, you, know. you just need to read them. That's all. It's going there. It's going there. Look, today I can sit at home. I have more computing power in my smartphone than NASA had in the 70s. The entire NASA. NASA, I mean, and I say, yeah, in the 70s. I can do anything. I'm a god. I can publish books. I can publish videos. I can, you know, have a, have a podcast. I'm a radio station. I'm a television station. Who the hell needs other people? You know? I can lock myself in a room right now, never exit, and be more productive than all the previous generations of humanity combined. This is the power we have today already, and it's nothing compared to the power we're going to have in 10 years. Nothing. Kurzweil is right. This is singularity, I mean, but not in the way he thinks. He's an optimist. I'm not an optimist. I think if people, I think people can't stand each other, honestly. I think people can't stand each other. They have collaborated over 10,000 years because the alternative was to starve and die. But now that they have the opportunity to draw apart, forget it. What society, what community, what family, fuck all that. I mean, people would just lock themselves in rooms. You'll never see them from birth to from cradle to grave. You'll never see them. They will be taken out of rooms only when the body decomposes and stinks the entire apartment building. It will be like the Black Plague. People were taken out of buildings only when they had died and their bloated corpses, you know, could be tolerated no more. That's the future. It almost seems like the future is going to be a brain in a jar and some sort of solution connected to different nodes of stimulation. You don't see much of a brain happening. That was, of course, the, the utopian view. There was a dystopian view, Huxley and others, and there was a utopian view. And the utopian view was technologies, technologies are going to connect all of us, the global village, and we are all going to become cells in a mega brain. Do you see any hint of this? I don't see a hint. The of collective it. consciousness, like Jung described. What collective consciousness? You have girls peeling bananas and having 16 million followers. This is the collective consciousness. We have dumped down objective measures of literacy and everything else are, are unequivocal, indisputable. We have become much more retarded than we have been 20 years ago. Much more retarded. The idea of generational cycles interests me when it comes to these subjects, how we have periods of crisis and periods where there will be global war, and certain people uh, will be culled out of the herd, as it were. And from the ashes of that, there will be a new world where uh, we move into a different di uh, direction than the current degenerate direction that we're in now. I'm, I'm a scientist, so I don't use any of the terms you use. I don't know what is a crisis. I don't know what is culled out. I don't know who decides to call out what. I, I don't know who called out, who was called out in the Second World War. Uh, well, military scientists and historians know very well that uh, when there's a war, humanity calls out or separates the weak from the strong. Not true at all. Who said that? Actually, wars separate out the strong from the strong. Exactly my point. Any way you want to slice soldiers, it. Soldiers, soldiers are strong. Exactly my point. Uh, when the war is over, only the strong survive, and they go back to their towns where they came from procreate and create a, a stronger grouping of people. No, you didn't listen to what I said. The strong die, the weak remain. Oh, really? Okay. The soldiers die. Yes, what to do? Soldiers are much stronger than the general population. They die, not the population. Some of the population dies, but mostly soldiers. But that's, I don't understand the term cal. Cal is a eugenic term. It means that, that certain people are selected to die. A everyone dies. Everyone, if I drop a nuclear bomb. So you're bomb, saying when uh, there's a war, you have dies. five of the weakest soldiers and five of the strongest soldiers, the strong ones die? Listen, can, can we get survive? rid of this nonsense? In today's world, everyone dies. Strong, weak, old, young. Today we have a total war. Everyone dies. I'm an Israeli. Trust me. Everyone dies. 
There is no culling. Culling to cull is to select. There's no selection in total war. So do you think eugenicists are uh, narcissist types of philosophies? Eugenicists? Depends which, which strand of eugenics. Uh, not necessarily, no. But Like the Margaret Sanger uh, version. Agress and Sanger was probably a racist rather than a eugenicist. It's, uh, but you, you could, let's put it this way, you could have a meritorious eugenics. It's not, unfortunately, it got associated with Nazism and so on. So, but otherwise, I do think, uh, I do think um, merit-based eugenics uh, could be easily defended morally and otherwise. But in a, in a world of total war, when, when the nuclear bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, there was no culling. Everyone died. Nuclear war is indiscriminate. In that context, yeah. No, in any context. Today, war is total. Actually, you can make the case that people who did survive were strong. Today, war is total. Survival is random. Not because you're strong. Because you, because you were far away from the epicenter. What if you're strong and smart? You don't need to be strong and smart. You need to be in the right place. If the bomb is dropped, you Which can be... Which means you're strong. smart enough to be in the right place. You don't, you're not smart enough to be in the right place. You just happen to be in the right place. It's random. That's precisely what I'm trying to, be, to say. It's not correlated to any trait, any choice, anything. If the bomb is dropped, dropped two centimeters to the left, you're fucked. If it's dropped two centimeters to the right, you're smart. It's nonsense. It's rank nonsense. Well, well there's two components here genetic strength and intelligence. So if they drop a bomb and only 2% survive, then those 2% of people are strong, genetically strong, right? No, not right. Not right. This is total nonsense. It's total ignorance of, of genetics, of warfare, of everything. I'm sorry, but you're talking utter, unmitigated rubbish. What's your proof that it's rubbish? I have no idea what you're talking about. If I drop a nuclear bomb, everyone dies. If you happen not to be there, you don't die. What does it have to do with whether you're smart, you're strong, you're young, you're a woman? Well, it all really depends on the epicenter and the radius of the damage of where the uh, explosion occurs. but within the radius, everyone dies. It doesn't correlate with your traits. I even don't understand what the hell you're talking about. It's so nonsensical, I don't have a way to relate to it. Well, there's no way that everyone is affected the same way uh, with radiation and uh, a bomb. Evan, let's cut it. Let's cut it out. Are we finished with this trend? Yeah, we can move on to other questions. Okay. So are there other questions that I missed that you want to talk about? No, you were quite thorough. I don't see anything else. Well, that's a question you should ask yourself. I'm here, available, if you want to ask me. Well, about the question I was talking about earlier. Look, I know you disagree with me uh, with a military and warfare, but so essentially you believe that all people are the same. Whether you're strong or smart, uh, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. All people are not the same, but when a nuclear uh, bomb is dropped, all people are the same. All people, of course, are not the same. For example, if you raise the topic... So survival of the fittest is something you don't factor in. If you raise the topic of an epidemic, that's a different issue. An epidemic is selective. People with specific genes... So you believe that radiation affects everybody the same, no matter what your genetics are? More or less true with radiation. Not true with epidemics. Obviously, epidemics have a culling effect. But they have a culling effect specific to a gene. Not a culling effect of the strongest or the smartest or the best. But a culling effect of those who have the gene which predisposes them to survive this and only this specific epidemic. So we have, for example, proof that the people who live in Europe today had a gene which predisposed them to survive the Black Plague, the Black Death. Exactly. But that's it. It's a gene which predisposes you to survive the Black Death. You can be a retard with 30 IQ, and if you have this gene, you survive. Yeah, yeah, but also in warfare, you could be a smart guy and not be in a place where the stupid guy gets shot. You cannot be in the right place when a nuclear bomb is dropped. So you are saying, like, for example, in history, how we had the Enola Gay drop a bomb in uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima, that if you were in the same mile quadrant, if you will, that you would be equally destroyed. It doesn't matter whether you're strong or, All or smart don't. or anything. True. All so people. really, survival of the Without, fittest uh, doesn't make sense here. 
survival of the fittest makes sense in other contexts, but under a nuclear bomb, directly under a nuclear bomb, no, it doesn't make sense, of course. Because well, well, directly under a bomb, everybody right, period. dies for That's sure. It. The rest is irrelevant. Epidemics have to do with survival of the fittest. That's true. And some conditions have to do with survival of the fittest. For example, um, economic conditions have to do with survival of the fittest. So one of the major theaters of natural selection is Silicon Valley. That's a major theater. Another major theater is Wall Street. It's also survival of the fittest. So, of course, I'm not disputing the fact that there are theaters and circumstances and situations which are selective. Selective for intelligence, selective for psychopathy, selective for ruthlessness, selective for collaboration. So you can have situations where collaboration would grant you a survival value, uh, um, an advantage, evolutionary advantage. Uh, collaboration, not the other way. Or you have a situation where cannibalism would provide you with a survival value, like this um, football uh, team in the Andes. Or you have a situation where having the right gene would, would provide you with survival value, like the guys who survived the Black Death and lived on to have progeny and so on. So, of course, and of course, if you're in Wall Street, if you're ruthless and merciless and psychopathic and so on, you have a survival, it presents a survival value and a culling opportunity. Well, that's my, my point. Yeah, well, of course, there are environments in which, in which people are selected for something, for anything. And uh, no one can dispute this. It's a totally normal assumption. In this sense, it's an open question whether modern medicine, taxation, um, measures that support weak segments of the population, whether they are beneficial species-wide. This modern, modern medicine, for example, perpetuated many, many weaknesses and many weak people, allowed many weak people to survive. And negated, of course, some of the effects of natural selection and so on. To this, scientists answer that natural selection now has an extension uh, via society, like evolution proceeds now via social means. Well, you could argue that, and you could argue for eugenics. If you ask me what is my natural inclination, my natural inclination is eugenic. I do think we need to put a limit, for example, to how, ma how many resources we use in keeping alive people whose usefulness to society is over by any measure, by any conceivable measure. I'm not talking about people, you know, that you can argue, but people who, you know, co in coma, for example. There are tens of thousands of people in coma after 20, 30 years still kept alive at a giant expense to the public purse. I'm not sure that's a rational choice. And so on. So, yes, of course, there is a pla there is place for all this. Of course, it opens very big, strong, I mean, moral questions like slippery slope and who will make the decisions. And But I think all these can be settled. In the, the, minute we, the minute we acknowledge that many of our public policy choices and many of the public goods we provide are irrational, not based on rationality, and disutilitarian, in other words, decrease utility, the minute we make this admission, the road is open to establishing principles and morality which will protect against abuse, because everything is open to abuse. Eugenics is open to abuse, of course. And, but as things stand now, I, I think we are committing uh, collective suicide. In this sense, I agree with you. Well, what do you think of those people that might say, uh, you know, Hitler was a bad person, Hitler was evil? And by you agreeing to certain aspects of what Hitler did, uh, by association, you're evil or bad. I think it's always wrong to make blanket statements and blanket judgments. Uh, I'm a Jew. Adolf Hitler killed one third of my nation. Therefore, I cannot never be suspected of being an adherent of Adolf Hitler, neo-Nazi or a fan of Adolf Hitler. But those people still... Yeah, but wait, 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 let me finish. Let me finish. I think I'm going your way, actually. Well, I don't know if it's care my to way. Listen. But to say that everything Hitler said and done was absolutely wrong, stupid, or evil is stupid. You, There's no... I mean, blanket statements by definition are wrong. 
Now, some of Hitler's policies were abhorrent, horrible, and also stupid, by the way. Exterminating the Jews was absolutely rank stupidity. Hitler could have ended up with the atomic bomb had he not killed the Jews. So that was simply stupid. It was a stupid act. But um, his contention... It's interesting you say that because uh, apparently Hitler and his German scientists did have uh, the nuclear bomb or the atom bomb, really. And Hitler uh, was against using it because he was afraid that uh, the atmosphere, there would be a chain reaction in the atmosphere and it would destroy the, uh, the planet. I, I never heard that one. But his contention that um, in extreme cases where people are no longer useful to society and constitute only a burden to society, uh, and therefore we should apply utilitarian principles propagated and established by British thinkers, by the way, not by German thinkers. Yeah? I, Even American thinkers. Uh, yeah. I tend to agree with him on this. And I'm a Jew. I think he's right. Maybe I would have drawn the line somewhere else. Because he, for example, he, he's, he exterminated among the 130,000 people um, who were killed you, with this policy. He exterminated many people I would not have killed. But that some people uh, should be, uh, that some people should not be given medical uh, treatment or, or support, economic and otherwise, because they no longer contribute to society and can nev never ever contribute to society, never mind what would happen, could happen and will happen. That is something that cannot be contested on any rigorous philosophical, in any rigorous philosophical way that I can see. That we, that we recoil is a result of conditioning. We have been conditioned with, uh, with the stories like the say, all life is sacred and this kind of thing, you know, but eugenics. Where do you think that type of thinking came from? Do you think it's a Jesus thing? Well, sacredness of life, that life, all life is sacred, is Judeo-Christian, Judeo yes. We find in the Talmud many, many sayings to that effect. So it's Judeo-Christian. And maybe when you're a nation of uh, 13 million, like the Jews, it makes sense. Because then, really, every single life counts. But in a world with 8 billion people, um, a world where tens of millions are net burden will never ever be able to contribute anything whatsoever, not even sperm, not even children, nothing. I mean, is it rational to continue with massive outlays on, on I mean, <laughs> every dollar spent on maintaining a coma patient in his state of coma for 25 years is a dollar not spent on a potential black kid, mind you, I'm not a racist, black kid who is a genius in mathematics. The, th there is a limited quantity of resources. We need to recognize scarcity. We need to allocate rationally. Currently, our allocation is of economic resources is skewed by irrelevant and irrational sets of considerations in almost every sphere, by the way. We don't make rational choices in anything, not in healthcare, not in warfare, nothing. We, we react to slogans and to you know, mantras, and I don't know what. Do you suspect, since the ability of women to vote was established, uh, and their distinct political signature in the political landscape, that questions like the value of, er of every life have become more prominent and thereby injecting more empathy into discussion, uh, as it were, and that hard decisions uh, that men, for the most part, are better at making have been softened or blunted. The, the evolution, because it's not been a revolution as we, we like to pretend. It's been an evolution. First suffragettes started to operate in the United Kingdom uh, 200 years ago. It's been a process of 200 years. The evolution of women's standing in society, access to the levers of power, takeover of certain professions, adoption of male behavior patterns and mores, uh, direct competition with men 
even when it's not warranted. Confusion between equality and identity. So women don't want to be equal now, they want to be identical. A ruination of gender roles, which directly threatens the species. I have, I maintain an extremely dim view of what women have done in the past few decades at least. Extremely dim view. I think there has never been a social movement more destructive to human society and the species as a whole than what had transpired out of feminism, malignant feminism. I think we have lost it as a species. I think gender confusion, gender, gender vertigo, as it's called in the literature, is not a minor thing. It's at the foundation and at the core of our continued functioning as a biological species. I think the confusion between biological roles, social roles, expectations, and narratives and myths is at its apex and deterring men, women and men from approaching each other and initiating any meaningful contact, with the exception, of course, of one night stands. I think we are on the verge of a precipice. And one of the things that, that has happened is that um, is the renew is the new emphasis? It's not renewed emphasis, but new emphasis on values which do reflect what you could call feminine psychology, and these are the values of social support, or solidarity, empathy, intimacy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Today, if you read even psychological literature literature in my field, if you read sociological literature, if you read literature in, in any of the social sciences, they read like um, exclusively feminine texts, texts which reflect um, female preferences, females mode of interaction, females, female, uh, females inner landscape, females psychodynamic processes. And is there a difference between the psychology of women and psychology of men, don't tell anyone, but yes, enormous. It is politically incorrect to say so. You can lose your job easily. But yes, absolutely. These are two subspecies. Everything is different. And to subjugate, to, to dominate, to dominate the discourse and the narrative with only one side, mind you, um, Situation has been equally bad when only may, men dominated. It's never good to have an asymmetry. Never, because you lose the resources of the other side, you know? So when there was male chauvinism and so on and so forth, I don't think the world was much much better place. It's, I, I disagree with female chauvinism as I, as I disagree with male chauvinism. Why is it then, when we look to the past, past achievements in science, philosophy, and other important endeavors that have elevated human existence, it's predominantly men. And for the most part, women really haven't played a big part uh, in these achievements. I think men are better at some things, which, because men dominated society, they made important. In other words, for example, men are better at, uh, at uh, technology. And because they are better at technology, they declared that technology is very important. That's a, that I think this was the sequence. Our values followed our advantages. So we were, as men, advantageous in some fields, and we made these fields dominant. We, we said, okay, because we are, you know, because these are, because we are good at these things, they are important. Women were equally good at other things, but these other things were not considered important. For example, maintaining a home. Also caregiving. Caregiving. Um, community. Glue. The glue of the community was was uh, females, not men. Men are conflictive and ad adversarial. So, empathy, uh, networking. The very first, very first social networks were actually female networks. So, but these were considered not important because they were the enclave of of women. It's exactly we have a similar phenomenon when women take over a profession, the average wage in this profession declines. So women took over, for example, teaching in universities, and um, the law, law, the law, and uh, some some uh, no, some uh, str some uh, 
disciplines in medicine. Wherever women take over, suddenly, and teaching, teaching in schools, wherever women take over, suddenly the wages collapse. It's, it's the relative value that society places upon the contribution of women. Since society is still dominated by men, but by and large, men assign a lower value to anything women are good at, but it doesn't mean women are not good at anything. It simply means that what they were good at was undervalued by men because men were in control. Male chauvinism is as stupid as female chauvinism. Regrettably, we are exchanging one for the other. It's, we didn't learn the lesson. We did not create an integrated, a truly integrated society. It's a power play. Like uh, if you look, for example, at sexual behavior, women became men. Women now have almost as many one-night stands as men. Women curse. Women drink as much as men for the first time in history. Women, you know, women became men. Now, entire human... And by extension, you could say that men became women. Oh, oh, men became women, yes. There's a convergence, I agree. You can say that today there is a unisex creature with two sets of genitalia. A unisex creature with penis and a unisex creature with vagina. That's the human species. While all gender differences and roles are being erased furiously, and have a look at the Me Too movement, it is founded, no, no question, it is founded on some real cases of sexual harassment, but it has taken it to the point that anything and everything, any type of behavior of communication became sexual harassment. So it's bad. Picture is bad. Women are driving us, and I'm, this I'm blaming women, 100%. Women are driving us to a very bad place. What do you say to people who say that men, in a way, are responsible for this because they don't put their foot down and stop all this nonsense by certain toxic women? <laughs> it's a problem because men are still dominant. It's like, you know... Uh, women. Why is this mostly happening in Western societies? Well, it's not only in Western societies. I know when's the last time you've been. Primarily. Yeah, I don't know when's the last time you've been to China. I worked in Africa for years. I'm from the Middle East. Uh, no, no, that's definitely. This cancer is spreading everywhere. India, I mean. No. I don't know why men. Well, I know India and Israel primarily have a big issue with uh, women abusing men, uh, doing false claims of. Abuse. It's all over. It's all over. It's all over. I mean, China now we we have a. De I just had a delegation coming back. I mean, it's it's all over. I don't know why men don't organize, and one why when they do organize, they organize in pretty comic ways. Um, I mean, uh, MGTOW and this kind of thing. Instead of organizing as a real political power uh, to reclaim some lost territory and to balance just to balance, to create real equality. Do you dispute that women uh, deserve equal access to education? I don't. Equal representation in front of the law? I don't. No one disputes. Well, only because there's punitive damages for you, like if you were at a job and you were to say something like that, you'd probably get fired. I know. I know. I know, I know firsthand, by the way. So... Um, I think men... So how is it exactly that society is dominated by men if you can't say these things? Is it because of uh, certain types of men that l no. don't let other types of men... No, there are two reasons. We'll have to finish with this one. There are two reasons. First of all, women dominate now many levels of power in many professions. And for example, in, in academia, the majority are women. Majority of professors are women. Uh, not the majority of administrators, but majority of professors are women. And a sizable chunk of, of the administration. That's one thing. Second thing, um, the skills needed in a future world are mostly feminine. For example, we need, uh, you need to know networking. You need to do empathy. You need to, to interact with people. You need to interface. You need, I mean, these are all um, feminine skills. Adversarial and conflictive postures are penalized. You need to, to, to support, to provide support, and so on. So female, uh, women are better suited to the world of the future. 
better suited psychologically and otherwise to the world of the future. It's not an accident that they are on the ascendance. They are on the ascendance aided and abetted by specific technologies and specific reorganization of the workplace and specific reorganization of politics and so on. All of society is, is gearing up to accommodate women because women now can provide the evolutionary survival advantage. Um, How is that if men invented the technology that allows them to do these things in a way men are also responsible for? Well, don't forget which men invented. Um, it's a highly specific profile of men. It is a myth that all men were involved in all the... For example, I mentioned in one of my interviews, the fashion industry was established mostly by homosexual men. It's not the thing to say. It's a horrible thing to say. If you say this... You will lose your job and you will be blacklisted and so on. But it's a fact, statistical fact. The entire fashion industry was invented by homosexual men. Yeah, that's the fashion industry. What about technology, though? Wait a minute, that's fashion. Technology industry was invented by schizoids, people with a highly specific psychological profile. By the way, it's not some vaccine. It's a diagnostic and statistical manual. <laughs> In the diagnostic and statistical manual under schizoid personality disorder, it says... <laughs> The majority of hackers, programmers, and so on are schizoid. The people who invented... Great, I guess I'm a schizoid. Well, <laughs> no shame in that. You just asked me a question, I'm answering. I'm a schizoid too, so makes two of us. The people, the people who invented modern technologies were not a cross-cut, a representative sample of the male subspecies. They were highly selective men with an extremely limited psychological profile. And they created the technology in their own image. And, and so this technology could not serve a wider purpose for a wider audience. It was highly, it was intended to help to facilitate communication because these people were not good at communicating. It was intended to facilitate networking because they were shy and avoidant. It was intended to facilitate equality because they felt shunned and they felt boycotted and excommunicated. It was intended, in other words, to compensate for their lacks and deficiencies. It so happened that these lacks and deficiencies also characterize women. Women being uh, not a minority numerically, but like uh, an underdog. Socially. Women, socially, yeah. Women being a social minority, if you wish shared the same characteristics with schizoid males. The men who invented the technologies were actually shared a lot with females, uh, with women, not sexually. I'm not saying they were not heterosexuals. I'm just saying that in terms of social standing, social functioning, and so on and so forth, they had a lot in common with women, actually much more in common with women than with red-blooded uh, rednecks, <laughs> let's say. So... It's not an accident. These, so you're saying these type of men, these social underdogs, if you will, um, created this technology for themselves, yes, but it exactly. also dovetailed yes. with female proclivities. Uh, yes. One underdog, one underdog class created technologies to empower themselves, thereby empowering all underdogs. Isn't Twitter used nowadays by underdogs all over the world? political activists, minorities, and so on? Isn't it the weapon of choice of all underdogs? I mean, one underdog class, schizoid males, not me, diagnostic and statistical manual, one underdog class created an underdog empowerment technology called social media, called what have you. Underdog empowerment technologies. And these underdog empowerment technologies, guess what? Empowered underdogs, including women. Women were just the most numerous class of underdogs and the best suited to use this technology and to leverage it. And here we are today. Hmm. Okay, well, uh, Sam, thank you for joining us on the show. Thank you for having me and thank you for your patience. <laughs> yeah, don't worry about it. Um, and where can people find more information about you and your work? Just type Google, uh, type some Google Sam Vaknin and, you know, from Wikipedia down, you have everything. Okay. Talk to you later. Talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you for joining me on the show. Like and subscribe and comment below and see you guys next time.